This video considers the way different professions think about system efficiency. There are at least four perspectives on efficiency, which vary by profession. Engineers think about mobility. There are many ways engineers measure mobility. The Highway Capacity Manual is put out by the Transportation Research Board. This measures the level of service on road segments, freeway segments, and on intersections. There are also chapters to measure bicycle and pedestrian level of service. Every year, the Texas A&M Transportation Institute puts out an urban mobility report. This ranks congestion levels by city, and it says, for instance, Minneapolis is the 15th most congested metropolitan area in the United States. And everybody says, woohoo, because our numbers are higher. That means we're a more important metro area. Or, woohoo, because it's not so high, so we have less congestion. Depends on your point of view as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Roadway mobility can be measured at different scales. The scale of the intersection, the scale of the road length, the scale of the subnetwork, the scale of the trip, and the scale of the network as a whole. Measures can be based on travel time, or based on flow, or some combination of the two. Depending on the scale that you're using, the measures of mobility efficiency that you should be looking at varies. So at the intersection approach, say someone is approaching an intersection from a particular direction, we might look at the volume to capacity ratio flow over the maximum amount of flow that can be accommodated there. We might look at the length of queues. We might measure how much stop delay there is. How long does somebody have to wait on average at that approach? You want to minimize stop delay. It's not clear you want to minimize volume to capacity ratio. One could minimize volume to capacity ratios by having no cars. That wouldn't necessarily be very efficient either. You could minimize the volume to capacity ratio by adding a lot of capacity. That may or may not be efficient. You want to minimize queue length, all other things being equal, because queue length is going to be highly correlated with stop delay. For the intersection as a whole, you might look at what is called critical lane volume, basically what fraction of the total intersection's capacity is being utilized. You might look at the average density for all people at the intersection, or road segment. You might look at the measure of density or volume to capacity ratio, or you might be looking at delay or average travel time. Now you say, well, well looking at delay, that makes a lot more sense from the user's point of view. Why are we looking at volume to capacity ratios or density if you're an engineer? You might be interested in the utilization of the system. So how much throughput can you get? That's a good rationale. But what's the reason that it's being done? How do we measure these things? We have six foot magnetic loops that we embed into the pavement, which measures whether there's a big metal object on it or not. That's called the occupancy. And the number of times that a big metal object goes over that loop per unit time, that's the flow. These are really easy things to measure. If we want to measure time, we can infer speed and thus travel time from flow and occupancy. And that will lead us into what we're going to talk about in future videos when we talk about traffic flow theory. Flow or throughput is easier to measure than speed or delay. If you don't have those big magnetic loops, you might have a tube counter across the road for a, tempor for a temporary counter. You see these are basically a hose. You drive across the hose, a big puff of air goes down the hose and turns a little mechanical dial one notch. It's 1930s era technology. It's dirt cheap. People have these things around and they're easy to use for traffic counts. but not as accurate as you might like. Another key problem is that at many traffic signals the inductive loop data is used in real time but then it's thrown away so we don't keep the history. That happens in many places. So like the drunk looking for his keys, the engineer is looking for a measure of effectiveness where they are counting cars, not how the user experiences the system or what the user cares about. There are other measures of the system as well. For instance, think about the commuter driving to a nice suburban location where there's automobile storage right next to the building they, they work in, where they can walk six meters and be inside the door. In contrast, when going to a, a more urban place like the University of Minnesota or downtown, finding parking and paying for parking is a significant cost and a major deterrent to making a trip in the first place. For instance, if you need fuel, how easy can you find that? There used to be many more service stations than there are now. There are a few reasons. Cars are more fuel efficient. They go a little bit longer. There are economies of scale in service stations, so service stations are bigger. People don't like having gas stations next door to them, so nobody allows gas stations to be built in residential neighborhoods. There are also mobility measures for transit, walking, and biking. How fast can you go somewhere by walking? How much delay do you have at intersections? It's a signalized intersection. How long until the pedestrian phase turns to the walk phase? We talked about consumer surplus in a separate video. Economists might think about the world in terms of demand, willingness to pay, and actual price. 
The difference between what a consumer is willing to pay and what the consumer actually pays is the surplus from that consumer. That number is summed for all consumers. Every origin destination pair has its own consumer surplus calculation. For travel going from point W to point E, there are a certain number of users and there's a certain travel time. Similarly, going between point N to point S, crossing the path of the user going from W to E, there is also a travel time at a flow. If we change the traffic signal timings at the intersection that serves those two markets and give more green time and thus consumer surplus to the WE market and less to the NS market, then we have added to the consumer surplus in one market and lowered it in the other. The total may increase or decrease depending on the efficacy of our signal timing change. What is the output measure here? What are we paying for? We're looking at the number of people who are going on a trip. Now why does anyone take a trip? Well, to achieve a purpose or for some end or goal. The trip is a means to an end. So the trip is a price for achieving the end, not the price for making the trip. We're not looking at the value of the end, we're just looking at the cost of the trip when we look at consumer surplus based on trips. Now these things are probably related. Our demand for the trip is related to the benefit that we get at the end, but they're not the same thing. We can at least aggregate consumer surplus across markets. In this respect, consumer surplus performs better than the idea of utility. We discussed utility when we talked about mode choice model. The idea of utility is how much benefit do you get measured in the abstract unit of utils. Individually, it's okay for you to rank different choices. However, I, the analyst, can't compare the utility of one person with the utility of another person. It's okay internally for your ranking, but you cannot sum up the utility across people very accurately. We can make an assumption that they're the same, or that every person's utility is weighted the same, but that's a big assumption. With consumer surplus, we're not making as many assumptions, so we can aggregate it across people. Of course, it assumes that time is interchangeable, and money is fungible, and people value those the same, which isn't generally the case. But as a high-level measure, it's useful, and it allows us to estimate a measure of effectiveness without making detailed interpersonal comparisons. This measure looks at the benefits to users. Do non-users have any benefit from the transportation system being available? Well, transportation gives non-users an option. In finance and real estate, people pay for an option to buy something. They say, I'm going to give you $10,000 for the option to pay a million dollars later to buy this, but you can't sell it to anybody else in the meantime. Options have economic value. The option to do something in the future provides me some economic value, value today. In principle, the analyst might be able to capture the value of options. In practice, it's very, very hard because potential travelers don't know what they would be willing to pay to have the option to take advantage of a, of a mode at some point in, a f in the future. Much of this is embedded in the market price of real estate, though. Externalities, environmental effects, should be quantified. The analyst wants to be able to quantify the value of time, the value of life, because roads might have crashes and because there are health effects due to pollution. There are also positive spillovers. Roads create new markets. They create extra benefits. They allow people to do more things than they could before. That's also not easily captured in the consumer surplus measure. Managers care about the productivity of the system. This is usually measured as the ratio of output to input. A transit system manager, for instance, may care about the productivity of labor, how much travel per hour of labor. Fourth is accessibility. It's how planners think about what the transportation land use system is trying to accomplish, connecting people and destinations. There are a variety of measures that might be used. This map shows the cumulative opportunities accessibility measure for the Minneapolis-St. Paul region the number of jobs that can be reached within 20 minutes by automobile in the AM peak period. Red indicates more jobs can be reached, green indicates fewer. People and firms clearly think about this in making location decisions as they pay a premium to locate in more accessible areas. The professions have different objectives concerning the transportation system. This is related to the time frame of action. Planners consider the longest time frame, followed by engineers, economists, and managers. Planners may be interested in where facilities locate. You want to put facilities where they are going to increase accessibility. Economists want investment in regulatory decisions such that the benefits outweigh the costs. Engineers think about design decisions. Often the objective is maximizing mobility or speed, subject to everything else being the same. Why is 50 kilometers an hour a speeding problem in a local neighborhood? Because everything else isn't the same. 50 kilometers an hour where the pedestrians are around creates a safety problem. 50 kilometers an hour, a two-ton vehicle will be much more likely to kill a pedestrian it hits, and it will be more likely to hit a pedestrian than at a slower speed. The engineer must trade off the speed and the safety. 
a manager in the traffic management center will not be interested in consumer surplus. That's much too macroscopic. The manager won't be interested in accessibility. That's also much too macroscopic in the long term. The manager has been given a fixed system and wants to make the system operate as efficiently as possible. There are different objectives. Each profession is claiming to represent the traveler. They're not ignoring the other professions intentionally, but they're just thinking in their own worldview, and everybody has a worldview. So taking the objective viewpoint, they're looking down on the problem and they're thinking of themselves as the central planner who's moving all these things around in order to make the system work best, work most efficiently for everybody. But it's very different than the perspective that the user of the system, the driver, the passenger, the pedestrian, or the cyclist takes. When you're a commuter, you don't think about how the system works for everybody else. You're thinking about how the system works for you, and everybody is the world's foremost expert on their own commute. None of these measures is complete and none fully consistent with how travelers themselves see the system. The issue of point of view is important. The professional aims to have an objective top-down, omniscient viewpoint. The user is subjective, bottom-up, and far from omniscient in their perspective. Yet some measures will be better than others at aligning the objective and subjective perspectives.